Forget about the thuggery of Turkish hooligans, Argentina's brutal and sometimes deadly Barra Brava supporters groups, and the knife-wielding gangsters who attach themselves to a handful of clubs in Eastern Europe, the most dangerous place to be a football fan is undoubtedly Indonesia. Between 1994 and 2022, at least 78 people were killed in football-related violence in Indonesia, and just four months ago, the country was rocked by the deadliest stadium disaster anywhere in the world in more than 50 years. A human crush, caused by riot police deploying tear gas, which then triggered a rush towards an exit, resulted in 135 people losing their lives, the youngest of them just three years old, meanwhile a further 583 people were injured. The fourth largest country on earth by population, and the largest in which football is the most popular sport, Indonesia is the most football crazed nation in Asia, if not in the entire world. It's for that reason that Indonesia has sometimes been dubbed as the Brazil of Asia, but they have been unable to replicate anything like the South American success. Despite being the first Asian country to appear at a World Cup, having done so in 1938 as the Dutch East Indies, while still a part of the Dutch Empire, Indonesia hasn't qualified for a single World Cup since then, and is currently ranked outside of the top 150 in the FIFA World Rankings. It makes Indonesia arguably the single biggest underachievers in all of world football, and that lack of success owes to a whole host of issues. Corruption is endemic to Indonesia, and football is no exception. From the government's National Sports Committee, to the PSSI that oversees Indonesian football, corruption, bribery and match-fixing runs rife within the sport, and there are a few parties that aren't in some way complicit. The degree of distrust and disdain in the PSSI and in the nation's top flight is so severe that in 2011, the PSSI's president was allowed to remain in post, despite literally being convicted of corruption, so a rival league was founded in an attempt to replace the former top flight. The lack of fairness and unpredictability caused by corruption, in a league where supporters claim to often know the result of a game before a ball has even been kicked, has added fuel to the fire of the thuggish and violent tendencies which have plagued Indonesian football ever since the fall of the country's military dictator, General Suharto, in 1998. But following the Kanjuran Stadium disaster in Malang, in which 39 children were among the 135 killed, how much more blood needs to be shed before something is done? Well, that's what I wanted to find out. So in today's video, join me on a journey to Indonesia, a country which has long been plagued by conflict and where so much of it now involves football fans, as we take a look at the country's incredible fandom, its more insidious elements, and what the future might hold for a country that is utterly obsessed with football. The enormous loss of life at the Kanjuran Stadium in East Java four months ago shocked the world, but not Indonesia. Football and death have long gone hand in hand in Indonesia, and whilst the sheer number of casualties at a single match was without precedent, those who followed Indonesian football had long foreseen the events that unfolded in the city of Malang. Earlier last year, the Jakarta International Stadium was inaugurated at a game between its new occupants, Persija Jakarta, and Tai Chonburi FC. The largest football stadium in Indonesia now, and among the largest anywhere in the world, with a capacity of 82,000, the grand opening did not pass without incident, as a barrier separating the lower level of the stands behind one of the goals collapsed. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but it was hardly reassuring that such an incident could occur at Indonesia's state-of-the-art new stadium, built at a cost of over $300 million, and only opened in 2022. The Kanjuran Stadium, by contrast, broke ground in 1997 and opened in 2004. Built at a cost of less than $2 million to become the new home of Arima FC, though it is hardly ancient, like so many stadiums in Indonesia, the Kanjuran Stadium fell well short of modern international safety standards. The gates at the 42,449 capacity stadium are only big enough for two supporters to enter or exit through at any one time, another common problem at stadiums in Indonesia, often resulting in hours-long waits for supporters to leave the stadium at the end of well-attended matches. 
As a result, the stadium's capacity had supposedly been reduced to 38,000 in recent years, but on October 1st, 2022, Arima faced their bitter rivals Persebea Surabaya in the Super East Java Derby. There is a genuine animosity between the cities of Malang and Surabaya, and their most fanatical supporters groups known as Aramania and Bonek for supremacy in the province of East Java, both on and indeed off the pitch. For such a big game, in which tickets were always going to be oversubscribed, Arima decided to rake in a little bit more cash and sell an extra 4,000, taking the capacity back up to 42,000. For what is one of Indonesia's most bitter rivalries, among some first competition, the game's implementation committee had advised that it kick off at 3 o'clock. Earlier kickoffs are more manageable and controllable for organisers and security forces for a variety of reasons, as well as making it easier for fans to get to and from the stadium due to public transport grinding to a halt on an evening. However, the game's broadcasters, Indosiar, who are the major broadcasters of Indonesian football, wanted the match to be played at night. Early kickoffs might be better for safety, but night games rake in a larger audience. Inevitably, and with not nearly enough opposition, the broadcasters got their wish. Persebaya Surabaya supporters were banned from attending the game, as away fans often are in Indonesia's top flight for safety reasons, but that didn't stop tempers from flaring among the home supporters when their team lost the game 3-2. At the end of the match, a pocket of incensed supporters entered the field of play. Persebaya Surabaya's players had already made haste, but the police claimed that the home fans had attacked their own players and officials. The police responded by deploying tear gas, which caused thousands of fans, most of whom hadn't even invaded the pitch, to rush towards the stadium's limited and narrow exit, some of which hadn't even been opened in time. In the bottleneck that was created, of the kind that we have seen in previous stadium disasters, well over a hundred supporters succumbed to asphyxiation, trampled, their lungs filled with tear gas, and the air starved of oxygen. That fateful day has come to be known as the Kanjuran Stadium Disaster, but that's a bit of a misnomer. A disaster is defined as a sudden accident or a natural catastrophe that causes great damage or a loss of life. But this was no sudden accident or natural catastrophe. It was eminently avoidable, and several groups and individuals could have, but chose not to prevent something exactly like this from happening, despite all of the warning signs and so many deaths which preceded it. It might be far-fetched to describe what happened at the Kanjuran Stadium as murder. It seems improbable that anyone involved wanted people to die, but a great many people have been disinterested in the lives of football fans in Indonesia, resulting in the same consequences. Indonesia is a country which has in some senses been shaped by violence and unrest. Europeans first arrived in the archipelago in the early 1500s, first the Portuguese and then the British, but it was the Dutch who colonised the islands, establishing the Dutch East India Company in 1602, followed by a formal colony known as the Dutch East Indies from 1800. The Dutch occupation of Indonesia was largely benevolent and mutually beneficial, which meant that it faced very little opposition from Indonesians. Nah, I'm just kidding. It was a system of rampant exploitation like all colonies, and it required continuous brutal repression by force in order to maintain control. There were a series of revolts against colonial rule throughout the 1800s, from the Padri War in West Sumatra at the beginning of the century, to the Amban Revolt in Saparua, and the Java War in, well, in central Java. The bloodiest and most significant of all, though, was the Aceh War, which spanned from 1873 up until almost the start of World War I in the northernmost tip of the Sumatra Island. The lack of support for the local Sultanate by an already weakening Ottoman Empire paved the way for a Dutch victory after 40 years of conflict, but not without significant cost. Over 100,000 troops were killed in total, almost 40,000 of them on the Dutch side. The number of deaths and the brutal manner of the conflict both drew controversy in and significantly weakened the Netherlands, 
and when the Japanese invaded in 1941, as part of their Pacific campaign during World War II, they were able to occupy the islands in just three months, while sustaining only minimal losses. When World War II ended and the Japanese surrendered, Indonesia declared independence, but the Dutch weren't willing to give up on the archipelago without a fight. The Indonesian War of Independence spanned for four and a half years, claiming the lives of somewhere between 25,000 and 100,000 Indonesian lives, and only ending in victory for the independence movement after the United States threatened to cut post-war aid to the Netherlands. Sadly, that wouldn't be the end of bloodshed in Indonesia. In fact, by far the worst was still to come. Nationalist and revolutionary leader Sukarno became Indonesia's first president, but after he began to become a little too friendly with the Soviets, the CIA launched a failed coup attempt in 1958. That didn't quite work out, but following another attempted coup in 1965, this time blamed on communists, Sukarno was indeed overthrown, replaced by Major General Suharto. Suharto led Indonesia's armed forces, and following the failed coup of 1965, he orchestrated a mass killing campaign, described by some as a genocide, with support from the CIA and the British intelligence services, in which somewhere between 500,000 and possibly more than a million Indonesians were slaughtered, often in extremely barbaric ways. The majority of those killed were either real or perceived communists and leftists, but ethnic Chinese, atheists, non-believers and others were also targeted. Suato was only forced to resign in 1998, following mass riots and nationwide unrest in response to the economic fallout of the Asian financial crisis, military defeat in East Timor, and government corruption. Suato's family's reported net worth of $38 billion when he left office after 31 years, which was enough to make him the third richest person in the world at the time, is often cited as an example of the scale of corruption under his rule. Every one of these violent and tumultuous flashpoints and epochs has shaped Indonesian football. The Dutch introduced football to the archipelago, with the first leagues and governing bodies being established during the early 1900s. Soratin Sosragondo, who founded the Football Association of Indonesia in 1930, better known as the PSSI, was himself a revolutionary who had been educated at Harvard. Football became an important symbol of Indonesian nationalism, with several players being prominent figures within the independence movement, and the PSSI came into direct conflict with the Netherlands East Indies Football Association, or NIVB, which later became the Netherlands East Indies Football Union, or NIVU. The NIVB was established in 1919, and the NIVU in 1938 by the Dutch, to oversee football in the Dutch East Indies and coexisted as a rival organisation to the PSSI. The Dutch East Indies qualified automatically for the 1938 World Cup in Italy, after Japan had withdrawn from qualifying, and Saratin wanted a game to be played between the PSSI and the NIVU teams to determine which team would represent the Dutch East Indies at the World Cup. The Dutch flat out refused, sending the NIVU team, which had nine players of Chinese rather than Indonesian heritage, and lost their opening game 6 0 against a Hungarian team that went on to reach the final. Since the 1938 World Cup adopted a straight knockout format, the Dutch East Indies remains the only team ever to have played only one World Cup game. Several major Indonesian clubs such as Persis Solo and Persib Bandung were founded during the country's colonial era, including Indonesia's biggest and most successful club, Persija Jakarta, which was originally named Vutbol Bond Indonesic Jakarta. It is at this point that I should apologise to multiple countries and cultures for my butchering of any and indeed quite possibly all pronunciations in this video. Although football was immediately popular in Indonesia, it wasn't all the way until 1993 that the country's semi-professional league known as Galatama and its amateur competition, or Persarikatan, combined to form a nationwide professional league system. It was a huge moment in the history of Indonesian football, but it also took teams who had previously had little relationship due to playing in different league structures and turned them into huge rivals. 
Super East Java rivals Arima and Persebaya Surabaya, for example, the opponents for last year's Kanjaran Stadium disaster, didn't even play in the same league systems until the 1990s. Indonesia is incredibly diverse. There are 1,340 recognized ethnic groups, over 700 different languages, and some 18,110 islands, including the five main islands where the majority of the population lives. The largest archipelago in the world to form a single state, given its complex history and demographics, perhaps it's little wonder that the country is somewhat fragmented and struggles with sectarianism. There's no doubt that sectarianism spills over into football, and there were heightened tensions and increased instances of fan violence as soon as Indonesia's nationwide league system was established in 93. That was greatly exacerbated at the end of the decade, though, after Suato was forced to resign in 1998, when Indonesia opened up a bit and began to consume more media from the outside world. Given football's popularity, it's no surprise that Indonesians became transfixed with football overseas, and particularly with Serie A, which was at the height of its success at the time. Inspired by the fan culture and ultras of the Italian game, Persis Solo and their vociferous supporters group, Passio Pate, began to adopt similar pyrotechnic and TIFO displays at their games. It didn't take long for other Indonesian clubs to follow suit. Indonesian supporters didn't just imitate European fan culture, they expanded upon it, bringing even more noise, colour and vibrancy to their displays than almost any European club. Whilst they took their TIFOs from Serie A, the fashion sense of supporters' groups would seek inspiration from Britain's casual culture, and indeed still does, with Adidas trainers Ben Sherman shirts and Fred Perry polos becoming the go-to attire. The most notorious fan groups associated with almost all Indonesian clubs tend to be more akin to militias than your typical football hooligan. Recruited at a young age and led by commanders, groups like Jack Mania, the fanatical supporters of Besiege Jakarta, undergo rigorous physical exercises and combat training, ready to engage in street fights and terrorist violence at almost every game they attend. For some, it has become ingrained in their matchday experience. For others, it was never about the football at all. The atmosphere created by Indonesian football fans is unlike anywhere else in the world. Well orchestrated, loud and flamboyant, the level of emotion is overwhelming and seems to be almost transcendent. For a lot of fans, that is exactly how it feels. Poverty is rife in Indonesia, and for many, life can be tough. It is among the most impoverished and disenfranchised communities, where unemployment is highest, that fanatical and often violent supporters groups do the bulk of their recruitment. Not dissimilar to gangs, in more ways than one, these groups offer people, many of whom are genuinely fanatical about football, a sense of community and belonging, a distraction and form of escapism from the often fairly bleak reality of their day-to-day -day lives, and a feeling that they're part of something bigger than themselves. Andy Fuller of Utrecht University, who has written extensively about Indonesian football on his website Reading Sideways, describes the scourge of hooliganism in Indonesian football as being cathartic violence, enabling an oppressed underclass to regain a sense of self-worth and control over their own lives. Of course, their legitimate anger around their own circumstances, lack of opportunities, and the corruption that plagues Indonesia is perfectly legitimate. But they are punching sideways, quite literally in some cases, by directing that anger at fellow impoverished football fans. It's also because of the social status of those involved in the supporters' groups, which tend to be the most prone to violence, combined with how commonplace and unremarkable that violence has become, that Indonesia's media now barely reports on violence involving football fans, except for in the most shocking of instances. One such case, which made international headlines, was the killing of 23-year-old Persija Jakarta supporter and recent Jack Mania recruit Haringa Sala in September 2018. Sala had made the journey from Jakarta to Bandung for a game between Persija and Persib, despite away fans having been banned from attending the game for years now due to security concerns. When he was identified as a Jackmania member, a group of Persib fans 
beaten, kicked him to death, before parading his body. What made the case so shocking was not the death of a 23-year-old, a young Percy Bandung fan had been killed in the same fixture the previous season, but that the incident had been caught on camera, recorded on a smartphone. The outcry, and international attention, prompted big promises. But in reality, once again, very little changed. 14 Persib fans were arrested as suspects, half of them minors, and the two charged with killing Serla, a 16 and 17 year old, were both minors as well. The league was suspended for two weeks in response to the incident, but systemic change wouldn't be forthcoming. There is a cycle of passing on the blame in Indonesia, every time someone gets hurt or killed. The government blame the footballing authorities, PSSI say that it's the police's fault, and the police themselves can often seem disinterested, if not outright the cause of a lot of the problems, not just at the Kanjaran Stadium, but in general, accused of deploying a hit-first, ask-questions-later policy, of assuming the guilt of football fans, and even of beating a 16-year-old fan to death in 2016. The 18 police officers equipped with tear gas at the Kanjaran Stadium on October 1st were put under investigation, and three later faced criminal charges. In the aftermath of the Kanjaran Stadium disaster, FIFA President Gianni Infantino flew to Indonesia, claiming to be offering support in light of one of football's darkest days, and keen to offer assurances that Indonesia would not be stripped of 2023 FIFA Under-20 World Cup hosting rights, as some had feared. FIFA and the PSSI, two organisations that have been dogged by alleged, and indeed proven cases of corruption, thought it appropriate to have a kickabout at the Madia Stadium in Jakarta, and upload a series of photographs of Infantino and PSSI chairman Mohamed Irawan laughing, smiling, and embracing one another. At almost the exact same time, the 135th victim of the crush took his last breaths in a hospital 400 miles away in Malang. Infantino never even visited Malang or the Kanjaran Stadium to see the site of the disaster, what had gone wrong, and how the disaster had been allowed to happen. In fact, he never left the capital city of Jakarta. He did meet with Indonesia's president, Joko Widodo, gifting him a Qatar 2022 World Cup ball and a red Indonesia shirt with his nickname on the back, as well as finding the time to give a big thumbs up pose whilst wearing a PSSI bucket hat. Tone deaf doesn't quite do it justice. Infantino and Widodo announced that the Kanjaran Stadium would be demolished and rebuilt to bring it up to line with modern safety standards. Though nothing was said of why it wasn't in the first place, or of how such a catastrophic event had been allowed to unfold. At the time, an independent investigation commissioned by the Indonesian government had determined that the PSSI chairman, vice chairman, and the entire executive committee ought to resign. But FIFA, and Infantino, offered PSSI their full support, which PSSI staff and management then used as a vote of confidence against the independent investigation to justify them remaining in office. It wasn't the first time that FIFA and the Indonesian government had come into direct conflict. Back in May 2015, at an executive committee meeting, FIFA decided to suspend the PSSI with immediate effect, which meant that Indonesian sides would no longer be able to compete in international football. The timing of that decision meant that Indonesia would be suspended from qualifying for the 2018 World Cup in Russia. It was a decision taken by FIFA as a consequence of what it believed to be government overreach into football matters, which ought to have been the jurisdiction of PSSI. It was the culmination of a chaotic four-year period for Indonesian football, even by its, believe me, very high standards. In 2011, PSSI chairman Nurdin Halid was convicted of corruption and sentenced to prison, but somehow managed to hold on to his position within Indonesia's Football Association, owing to his political connections. There was understandable outrage in Indonesia, and FIFA eventually had to step in and bar Halid from standing in the next election. In the meantime, the ISSP effectively split, 
and a new league was founded, the Indonesian Premier League, which was recognised as being the top flight of Indonesian football from 2011 through to 2013, but ran alongside the pre-existing Indonesian Super League, which continued throughout that period. It was a total mess, symptomatic of the disarray that Indonesian football was in, and when the leagues were unified in 2013, Bopi, the Indonesian government's governing body for sport, didn't want two of the teams who had previously broken away to compete, owing to their ownership status. It was that interference that had irritated FIFA, who said that it was a matter for the ISSP, and then readmitted the ISSP a year later, after they'd got their own way. If you were extremely cynical about things, you might suggest that FIFA presidents like Infantino were only interested in endearing himself to the heads of football associations like Indonesia, however corrupt they may be, because it is precisely those people who get to vote in FIFA presidential elections. No, 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 no. Far be it from me to suggest something like that, there is certainly no evidence of it, and it's not something that his predecessor pioneered on an industrial scale before getting banned in 2015 as part of a corruption case. Don't be fooled into thinking that the Indonesian government are the good guys in any of this, though, since that really couldn't be any further from the truth. At virtually every turn, they have displayed an ambivalence towards the safety, welfare, and life of football fans, and the fact that a football-mad nation of 275 million people ranks below Hong Kong and the Solomon Islands in the FIFA World Rankings is a reflection of how poorly the game has been managed at every level. On the pitch, prior to the Kanjuran Stadium disaster, there had been signs of progress, but they were knocked out of the AFF Championship, a tournament they have still somehow never won over two legs against Vietnam in their most recent fixtures. You could argue that a government like Indonesia's has bigger fish to fry than football, but that argument only holds up for so long. Football is such an enormous part of tens of millions of Indonesians' lives, 52 million Indonesians watch at least one game of football a week, and the violence and mismanagement of the sport has been on such an enormous scale for such a long time now that the disinterest in doing anything about it is quite frankly unforgivable. The big project that is currently occupying Indonesia's government and politicians is the relocation of the nation's capital from Jakarta to a brand new city named Nusantara, which is being built on the island of Borneo. That project is expected to cost the government $32 billion, meanwhile $40 billion is being spent in an attempt to stop the nation's current capital, Jakarta, from sinking into the sea. Opinion is split in Indonesia in regard to both projects, though no one doubts that certain individuals will do exceptionally well out of government contracts, regardless of the outcome. But if the Indonesian government can find over $30 billion for a new city, how much would it really cost to make football safe in Indonesia? A damn sight less than that, one would have to imagine. Given the overall state of football in Indonesia that I have just described, and the lack of will to implement any solutions, it ought to prompt laughter that there is talk of the country hosting the World Cup, but with FIFA and the PSSI, I suppose, why the hell not? The scale of corruption and match-fixing in Indonesia, which fans often claim leaves them knowing the outcome of a game before a ball has been kicked, is so extreme that in 2017, the rebranded Liga 1, Indonesia's top flight, promised to import foreign referees to officiate the league's fixtures, since domestic ones could no longer be trusted. Two weeks before the season began, the PSSI cancelled those plans, only for there to be so many controversial decisions on the opening day of the season, and such uproar among supporters, that they were forced to U-turn on their U-turn. Officials were brought in from Australia, Kyrgyzstan, Iran and Japan, but the project was scrapped again ahead of the following season. In November 2021, match-fixing whistleblower Zar Eka Wulandari was injured in a hit-and-run incident along with her husband, en route to give an interview with the police. Tomorrow, February 16th, there is due to be an extraordinary congress to replace the PSSI president and the entire executive committee, a long-overdue major overhaul in response to last year's stadium disaster. 
Following the disaster, all three professional football leagues in Indonesia were suspended, restarted on December 5th, with all remaining matches for the first half of the season to be played behind closed doors, and a recommendation that all future fixtures kick off no later than 5 o'clock. Radical reform is what has been promised, but we have been here before, and people are unlikely to believe it until they see it. Indonesian football has something very special, a passion for the sport and football culture that would be the envy of most of the world. Unfortunately, that passion is marred by corruption, mismanagement, incompetence, greed, extremists, and violent thugs. It is possible to remove the latter, which is a cancer, without spoiling the former, and actually whilst enhancing it. But there has to be the will to do that, from the top down and from the bottom up. Until now, that hasn't been the case. For the sake of football, and for the sake of Indonesia, hopefully one day that will change. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. I don't know about anyone else, but I knew very little about Indonesian football reform researching this video, other than an Australian documentary that I watched a few years back. Um, which is odd, given that it has such an enormous footballing culture and, uh, and the rest of it. So yeah, hopefully you found this illuminating. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, especially if you are Indonesian. I think that... You are a fairly sizable contingent of the audience of the channel anyway, so uh, yeah. And make sure, as always, that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC 7s and indeed my backup channel, which should be on your screens now. Uh, thank you, as I say, and you can also find me on either Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.